Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. One of the biggest challenges that we will be facing is that sea level rise will lead to one of the largest transfers of land from private hands to public title in history. Okay, adapters, welcome back to another exciting episode. I'm Doug Parsons, your host of America Adapts. Some of you might recognize that voice. It's Margaret Peloso, an adaptation lawyer with Vincent and Elkins. This is a re-release of the episode I recorded with Margaret in April 2018. Just like my previous episode, a re-release of the Deconstructing a Climate Skeptic episode, I want to go back into the archive and share this episode. First off, it's fantastic. Also, my listener base has grown considerably since the episode came out, and not every new listener goes back into the archive. And so much has happened since this episode has come out in the adaptation universe. I thought it would be useful to ground many of you in sea level rise and the law. Margaret walks us through how the U.S. legal system is and is not prepared to deal with the huge challenges of sea level rise and a receding coastline. Okay, it's been a busy fall. I just visited the Massachusetts Institute of Technology last month to get some recordings for a coastal retreat workshop they held. I'll be working on that one for a while, but definitely keep an eye out for that. For those longtime listeners who have already heard these re-releases, don't worry, I'll have a new episode out next. I'm hosting Rob Moore, the Senior Policy Analyst for Healthy People and Thriving Communities Program at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Rob and I will bring you all things flooding. Rob's been a leader in this space for a while and looking forward to sharing his stories with you. After that, I have Dr. A.R. Siders, a professor at the University of Delaware specializing in managed retreat. Dr. Siders and I will discuss the social dimensions of managed retreat and assess where we're at nationally on this issue. Some great stuff coming. Okay, before we get started with Margaret, there is some new content at the end of this episode. I did a short interview with Jesse Terry and Alex Wong, who have produced an album called Kevalina about an Alaskan indigenous community impacted by sea level rise. You'll hear a bit of their music and learn what inspired these professional musicians to dedicate a whole album to the issue of climate change. Good stuff. Okay, adapters, let's see if you can handle the truth of sea level rise and the law. Hey, welcome back, adapters. On today's episode, I am very excited to be hosting Margaret Peloso. Margaret is a law partner at Vinson and Elkins Law Firm. Margaret's area of practice are environmental law and climate change. With respect to climate change, she handles a variety of matters, including advising on climate change risk management, with particular emphasis on the changing regulatory environment and climate change adaptation issues. Hey, Margaret, welcome to the podcast. I think you're my first lawyer on the podcast. Uh, Well, I don't know whether to be excited or terrified about that, but thank you. You know, I want to approach it just for my listeners, you know. I was very excited about this episode because this is the law, but at the same time, it can get complicated very quickly, and, and I want to make sure that this is accessible. So we're going to kind of have different sections to this. You're a lawyer, and so what is Vincent and Elkins? Who, who are they? So Vincent and Elkins is a 100-year-old law firm that's based in Houston, Texas. Uh, we do a wide variety of things as a global law firm, but principally the firm is well-known for its work in the energy sector. So we counsel clients all across that space. So where are you at? Where are you located? Uh, so I office in Washington, D.C. But it sounds like you are all over the place because you're you're in high demand, right? <laughs> I, I spend quite a bit of time on the road, but that's what makes the job so fun. Okay, so your specialty is climate change, but I'm thinking of a law firm. What does that really mean? Are there clients out there that when they look at a law firm's website, they're like, I need someone who can do climate change, or do you have to sort of walk them there on why climate change is relevant to the work that you might do for them? You know, that's a great question because I think it's a marketplace that is changing very rapidly. For many years, the practice of climate change law predominantly meant that you were advising on potential regulations of greenhouse gas emissions under the Federal Clean Air Act. Uh, That was not work that I ever did as much of because I When I came out of law school, there was already a very well-established Clean Air Act bar that was doing a lot of that work, and I was not principally trained as a Clean Air Act lawyer, though I sometimes can pretend to be one now. And my interest has always been much more in adaptation and physical risk. And so for many, many years at the beginning of my practice, there was quite a lot of people saying to me, oh, well, that's really interesting, but why why would I need a lawyer for that? Or or what's a lawyer going to do in this space? And I think that conversation has shifted really dramatically in the last few years. And one of the big drivers of it has been that we are seeing a lot of demand from investors 
for improved disclosure around climate risks. And while much of that conversation began with disclosure of what we would call transition risk, so moving to a low carbon economy and can you produce your assets and how will you make money in the future, that conversation is increasingly turning to focus on physical risks. And so I'm finding that there are a lot more opportunities there to do that kind of work from a law firm platform. So who are kind of typical clients? I mean, it's not appropriate to mention their names, but just sort of what industries or what sectors? Sure. So I think a lot of the interest in this is, first of all, with any of the clients who are getting these kinds of proposals or requests from investors to do better disclosure. So a lot of that has been very heavily focused on the energy sector, both in what we would call upstream. So that's the, you know, producing oil and gas and making it available for use and also in the utility sector. Also quite a lot of work with the banking sector because many banks themselves are entities in which people make investments and they are also facing some pressure to disclose climate risks, which requires them to have a pretty sophisticated level of knowledge to drill down through not just, you know, where where are our assets, but where are the things in which we are invested and how are they exposed? So my exposure to, to lawyers mainly is through movies. And so I'm going to get into that a little bit later. My impression of, of the kind of law that happens out there is probably very Hollywoodized, which isn't healthy. But you know, I want to dig a little bit more into law and climate change. And if I had to guess that, I mean, there are a lot of lawyers out there and they cover so many different fields. And I would guess in some ways it's a very conservative kind of area. And when it comes to climate change, do you feel a lot of lawyers are they're on board in the sense that they recognize, I mean, they're not there being climate scientists, but is it, do you hear about skepticism when it comes to, in, in I guess, in law circles? So. I would not hazard to guess at the position of the legal profession as a whole with respect to climate change. I think much like the rest of the world, there is a wide diversity of viewpoints. You know, I think that what is interesting about climate and climate adaptation in particular and the law is that one of the things as lawyers that we are trained to do in our profession is to think about risk and think about mitigating risk and risk management kinds of issues. And so I do think that adaptation is the kind of space where the skills that lawyers have could be used in a really valuable way. I will say candidly, I think climate change law has been such a tiny part of the market up till now that if you're asking me sort of what does the average lawyer think about climate change law, I would guess the average lawyer is not terribly aware that climate change law is is a special is an emerging specialty that somebody can practice in. All right, I love that you, the use of the term hazard. I am I've got my work cut out with for me the lawyer on the podcast. <laughs> you weren't falling for that one. Um, and it, it just occurred to me I've had a lawyer on before, but I don't think she was a practicing lawyer. And it was Judge Alice Hill. She I tried to kind of get her to answer something. She ran circles around me, so I know how you guys you're trained to deal with people like me. So anyway, moving on, looking back at your sort of academic background, it's one of these incredible pedigrees, Duke, Stanford. But I mean, who encouraged you to focus on climate change adaptation? Do you feel the, are there law schools that are specifically focusing on adaptation now? You know, my my personal story is actually kind of a funny one. Um, I was in graduate school at Duke and I was studying artificial reef ecology. So I was looking at what happens when you sink boats and fish come to them and sort of how they interact with that infrastructure. And I thought it was a really fun thing. And I thought I might just continue along those lines and do marine biology and ecology for a career. And I increasingly got interested in climate change. And it was at a time when the academy was having a strong debate within itself about what the appropriate role of an ecologist or any kind of an academic scientist who worked on climate change was in communicating what they were learning beyond their intellectual community and more broadly to the world and the policy community. And I felt like that was what I really wanted to do. So I went to law school thinking like, oh, I want to do science policy communication. And so I will go learn policy. And when I left for law school, I was just getting started on my dissertation. And I foolishly thought that you could somehow go to law school on one coast, be in graduate school on the other coast and do field work, which was not really a thing that was terribly realistic. Uh, And so as I went back to reframe what I was going to do for my PhD after my first year of law school, I was very clear that I wanted to get out into the world and practice law and that I really wanted to focus on legal questions around climate change. And I was incredibly lucky to be advised by Mike Orbach at Duke and Meg Caldwell at Stanford, 
who were both really interested in coastal issues and coastal land use. And they said, gee, you know, there's a lot of really interesting questions around sea level rise and land use. And that seems like something where where you could do a lot of really interesting work. And so like most graduate students at that point in time, I wanted to have a dissertation topic and graduate and be done. So I said, okay, that sounds interesting to me. And that was sort of how my adventure started. Law schools, you, you can focus on, I guess, there's tax law, there's environmental law, mm-hmm. and I'm assuming that some of the climate change could fall under environmental law. But do you feel like with your own exposure that does, I guess, a law school merit its own sort of adaptation law school? Are we there yet? I mean, is it going to be that diversified? You know, I think it's an interesting question. I was at Stanford at a time when the leadership in the law school under Dean Larry Kramer was firmly convinced that for most lawyers, going to law school and just learning the law was not sufficient and that law needs to move towards more interdisciplinary education. Uh, but, you know, at core, law schools are in many ways still trade schools and they have to teach you a number of basic disciplines, right? Everyone who goes to law school has to take contracts and criminal law and civil procedure and torts uh, and constitutional law, right? A whole bunch of other things. And so depending on how one approaches a law school career, there is a limited amount of space for other things. And so, well, I think that teaching law students about adaptation particularly within the canon of environmental law or infusing into business law courses some of the practical implications of climate and what that's going to mean is important. I think the idea of a legal education that is focused solely on adaptation, that's that's what a doctoral program is for. (laughs) That's not really what law school does in a lot of ways, which is part of the reason that I finished my PhD. Well, we'll see how it'll evolve. I'll be curious. I mean, it's such a big issue, and it seems to be getting bigger. Mm-hmm. And so I, you wonder how the different sectors will think about it. And you had mentioned going into policy and such. And I had a question here, not so much of a question, but it's just I, I think it's interesting for lawyers to do adaptation because I've been involved on the policy side, and it's so wishy-washy. And it's frustrating because it's like, oh, it might be guidance or it might be some planning, but it just there's just no teeth to a lot of policy out there. And so with law, it just seems you're, you're backing it up with something. There's a sort of uh, a, the legal framework that I think people, I guess, respect more. Does this make sense? Because it, it, policy can be so just vague that we, we need the law to really kick in on this issue. And- yeah, I'm going to answer your question with a non-answer, which is, um, <laughs> I, you know, I think there are a lot of people who go to law school because they want to, quote unquote, do policy. I meet with a lot of science grad students who are thinking about law school, and that is where their interest lies. Generally, it is a really terrible reason to go to law school. I think, you know, law school is great if you want to practice law. There's a lot of influential things that can be done in the policy space by non-lawyers. Uh, and that is, you're right, distinct from practicing law. But I generally discourage people who are generally interested in policy as opposed to the nuts and bolts and day-to-day of being a lawyer from going to law school. I'll have a few more questions, but you just think of all the sort of backtracking that's happening within the federal government on climate change. And so much of what was happening was at the policy level, which can just unravel. Whereas if there's laws and sort of legal precedent, it's it's harder sort of to ignore some of those things. And so that's that's a bit of, I think, my frustration of the policy versus legal approaches. Let's start talking about the law, and we have been, but you wrote a book, and I've got this book right here, and I haven't gotten it autographed. It's Adapting to Rising Sea Levels, Legal Challenges and Opportunities. I've been reading this, prepping for this conversation, and I feel like I'm back in grad school. I've been scribbling notes, and it's a great book, but thank God I'm not getting graded and just for people out there that are interested, this is, you know, for people that are really interested, but it's very readable, actually. It's it's not, I don't, I wouldn't call it a technical book per se, even though it, it's, it, I think it provides that value, but it's very readable. I mean, I'm reading it, and I'm going, God, I hate reading textbooks, but it was fine. It's, I'm long since out of school. But what I sort of, I'm taking a long-winded way, you're like, get to the point, Doug. And it's just, I want us to have this conversation. You're standing in line in Burger King at like some rest stop and you're talking about these issues <laughs> because that's sort of like me. All right. We've chat before you came on, we had this conversation about, I want this to be accessible. So just think that I'm that guy in the line at Burger King as we kind of jump into some of these things and some of the language and rhetoric. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. One of these quotes I thought was just very exciting and is that, and I'm going to, I'm sort of paraphrasing you, but let's jump into this, is that sea level rise will lead to the largest land transfer from private to public hands in history. So what's that all about? (laughs) What it's really all about is how 
some of the underlying legal doctrines will work as land becomes submerged. As I'm sure you and your listeners know, the, the scale of sea level rise that we're talking about is rather significant. And while I do think that we will act to protect some places, for example, both the San Francisco and Oakland airports are vulnerable to sea level rise. And the idea that California is just going to sit by and let them become submerged, I, I just don't think that's plausible. But because of the amount of land and infrastructure that we have exposed to rising sea levels, it's we are not going to be able to protect all of it. And so some substantial portion of that land is going to go underwater. And that's where the public trust doctrine and some of these property law concepts around who owns what come into play that would lead to the land transfer. So let me unpack that for you a little bit. So the public trust doctrine is a common law doctrine, which means it sort of comes to us through inherited generations of law, what we would call the common law. And it says that the state owns submerged lands in trust for the people as a whole. So the state has the title and it's supposed to manage those resources to benefit all of the residents of the state. At common law, we recognize that the boundary of the public trust at the ocean or at a river is actually dynamic. So, right, when you normally buy a piece of property, like if you, you own a house, you can look at a map and you can see the four boundaries of your property and that's your property and that's your property forever. If one of the four boundaries is the ocean, then the outward boundary of your property at the ocean isn't actually fixed like that. We recognize that it can move back and forth over time so that if your land becomes submerged, it's not yours anymore. It goes from being your private land in private title to belonging to the state on behalf of the public under the public trust doctrine. If large portions of land become submerged due to sea level rise, what we will functionally see is a massive transfer of land that is currently privately held to being held by the various states in the public trust. So that's a pretty big deal that we have all this private land that's going to go transfer and we're not really thinking about it. And to me, and the book really goes down and it, it talks about a lot of, I, I guess, legal precedent in a lot of these decisions. And it's, it, it's kind of hard to get into all those things. But to me, as I, as I read all those different examples, you had to settle on sort of a sea level rise rate and you've brought up some numbers, but what you just described, but two feet versus six feet, you're having a much different conversation. And how does a public trust doctrine kind of factor in a moving target like that? This is one of the areas where I think the public trust doctrine is both perhaps an incredibly powerful and an incredibly useless tool in facilitating adaptation. And what I mean by that is that typically we recognize the boundary between the private and the public property to be at what's called the mean high tide line. And the mean high tide line in the law is actually measured as the 18.6 year average of uh, the location of mean high tide. So if you are somewhere where there's a lot of erosion or if you're experiencing sea level rise, the mean high tide line is actually underwater most of the time. And so what that means is to really use the public trust to influence upland adaptation, you have to get rather prospective about what land is private now that will become public because of submergence. Because if you're just looking at where the public trust is right now, it's already underwater, so it's not really anywhere that's practically all that occupiable by people. As what's already happening now is so like a lot of people and a lot of communities are not just going to sit back and lose this land to the oceans, and so they're going to armor the coast, you know, seawalls and such. And I, I want to throw things out if you if you could give the quick definition, so people who aren't familiar. So eminent domain, what is that? Could you just quickly define eminent domain? Sure. So eminent domain is the power of a state body to take somebody's property. So, right, like if you if the state wants to build a highway, they can come in and they can condemn your property and they can say, you don't own it anymore. We own it and we're going to put a road here and you have to move. Now, when the state exercises the power of eminent domain, their authority is constricted by the takings clause, of the United States Constitution, which is found in the Fourth Amendment. And that requires that the state provide the constitutional term is just compensation. What that typically means is they've got to pay you fair market value for your property if they want to take it and use it for something else. Okay. So 
Great. Thank you. So go, we're going back to the, these areas that are going to be inundated. And so communities are starting to build seawalls. Could the state preemptively use eminent domain to prevent this armoring from occurring? Because it, it will you look at some sea level rise models and say, look, you know, in 30 years, 50 years, this is all going to be underwater and you're going to negatively impact things north of you or south of you. C- could you use eminent domain in that situation? Theoretically, you could. <laughs> would you recommend it as a lawyer in today's climate? <laughs> you would have to pay for it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I do, I do question where the level of resource would come for that. I think the more interesting application you're seeing of eminent domain or what I would call physical takings in terms of resilience right now is that in New Jersey, in recovery from Sandy, they have been very proactive in many municipalities in rebuilding really large sand dunes uh, to protect coastal communities, right? Because the dune slows down the waves as they come in during a storm and will reduce the amount of flooding of communities that are behind the dunes. And so when New Jersey went to exercise eminent domain, and I shouldn't say New Jersey, the municipalities within New Jersey, to build these sand dunes, there were some people who objected to it and basically said, hey, you have to pay us. In one of those cases, really interestingly, what happened was the case went up to the New Jersey Supreme Court and the state said, yeah, you do have to pay them. But you know what, state, when you were in that eminent domain proceeding, you should have put on evidence of the storm protective value of that sand dune that you built. Right. So they were saying, yes, you are permanently physically occupying someone's property. So under the law, you have to provide them just compensation. But as we measure the just compensation, you have to think about the the resilience value, essentially, of building the dune. And that case ultimately settled, I think, for a dollar. <laughs> well, big money. Okay, so the governments could play the long game. And, and if my understanding of the public trust doctrine, if <laughs> and there's nothing natural about climate change, but in, in essence, sea level rise will be considered sort of a natural thing. If you lose your land, it's getting, you know, you get three feet that you're losing significant chunks of your land. In that situation, uh, no one has to pay that landowner anything, right? That's right. But where it gets tricky is that today, as people are responding to these threats, if they do build that seawall, as you note in the book, is that, you know, maybe you have a wetland system, de- you know, just down the coast from that, that could be impacted. Where's that water going to go that's being displaced by that seawall? And so someone takes a legal action to prevent that seawall from being built, or they want to take it down. And so there's going to be all this maladaptation occurring in the meantime, before we have these significant areas of sea level rise. And so there's going to just be a lot of legal challenges because of this people's response to it. I think that's right. And I think this is actually one of our biggest policy challenges, sort of pulling back up from the law, right, is that if you look at how sea level rise adaptation is functionally proceeding, what you have is you have state or local authorities that are making decisions about the appropriate use of individual pieces of property. And that's the level at which the litigation happens, right? Somebody goes in and tries to get a permit for a seawall and somebody doesn't want them to have it and they object and there's a proceeding and maybe there's some some litigation over the ultimate permit decision. But that's really on a property by property basis. And in many ways, that kind of a system is not really well suited to address the kinds of bigger picture questions and larger scale adaptation that we are going to need to really effectively address these issues. I do think that, you know, litigation will have a role because at some point in time, there will be some of these property specific cases that will establish precedent that will allow states or municipalities to assert adaptation principles in a more muscular way. Um, but I think it's important to understand that, the, especially when we're talking about these common law tools, the the scale of the decision-making is often smaller and more incremental, and that that is um, in tension with the physical scale of the challenges that we are facing due to sea level rise. Yeah, this gets complicated pretty quickly. (laughs) If you're going on, like, I just, I keep trying to think, again, going back to policies, what are some of the statewide or federal policies that encourage people to migrate from the coast so we can avoid all these sort of legal minefields later on? If you have an opinion on that, (laughs) you know, I I think that's a really challenging thing, because at the end of the day, it comes down to land use policy. Right. Mm 
and much of the coast is already built out. So we're kind of past the phase of the social experiment of like, how do we keep people from developing all of the coast? And we're now dealing with sort of second order questions about how do we deal with development that's already there? How do we think about communicating to property owners what their rights really are and what that means in terms of sea level rise adaptation? And what I mean by that is that one of the things that we see as a real tension in terms of promoting retreat is that lots of property owners do believe that they should have a right to do something like build a seawall to protect their house. And oftentimes, even if that's not a legal right they have, municipalities or others with land use permitting authorities may be slower to forbid things like seawall construction to protect existing houses that are already in danger because they are either concerned about political backlash or they're concerned about, you know, getting sued and having to pay somebody in a t- takings case or something like that. Uh, one of the things I do think is really worth watching in this space is that the California Coastal Commission released a sea level rise policy guidance document where they have tried to lay out what their views are on the permissibility of sea walls or not in the state. And I think one of the really interesting things they have done there is they have sort of said, gee, you know, if someone has a seawall and it gets to the point where there's enough sea level rise that the seawall is functionally holding back the public trust, we think that that seawall needs to be revisited and that property owner either needs to get a permit to occupy state public trust lands because functionally, right, they've created dry land where there would otherwise be ocean that would belong to the state, or they need to get a permit to take out their seawall and let the ocean go where it would otherwise go. Okay, so I want to pivot here a little bit because uh, something and I'm always thinking about Miami when it comes to sea level rise, and I've done quite a few episodes on it because it's it's going like sea level rise really is just going to be sort of a, a major crisis for that for that city. And there's something. And again, this is very wonky, but I think it's very important is if you could explain CERCLA or do you pronounce the ac- acronym for it? What, what is CERCLA? This is related to the Superfund law. Yes. Um, so CERCLA is the Superfund law, the Comprehensive Environmental Response and Liability Act, uh, colloquially known as Superfund. So CERCLA is a federal environmental law that was passed in 1980. And what it does is it imposes retroactive liability on owners operators, transporters, and arrangers, which I think are less important categories for what we're talking about, for hazardous waste cleanup, essentially. So if you own a site now that was used for some kind of an industrial process that resulted in hazardous waste being left upon it, even if you weren't there at the time it operated, you can have liability for for cleaning up that waste. And I think when you think about industrial sites in the coastal zone, right, one of the things that has been the engine of the growth of America is industrialization of the coastal zone from a very early period in our history. And obviously, industrial practices have changed quite a bit over time. And so there are a number of older industrial sites that will be cleaned up under the federal Superfund program or under state equivalents. Um, that now have to start to factor in climate change and sea level rise as they're designing remedies to make sure that the the cleanups that are done are protective of public health and the environment. Well, I think people think of Superfund sites if they do think about those kind of things is is a gas station. You know, let's say you, an abandoned gas station is that considered a type of Superfund site? You've got now the, sort of this toxic legacy of gasoline inside. W- would that be co- like, let's say, an abandoned gas area? Is that would that be kind of considered under this? It it could be, yeah. They, I mean, they could be cleaned up under a state program or under the federal Superfund program. So what I'm getting at is, and I think again about Miami. If you have the sort of sea level rise, if it's five six feet, and you're seeing major areas of inundation, you could have just dozens, if not hundreds of areas that are like these abandoned gas stations or whatever that are now underwater that weren't cleaned up properly. And so how is the law going to adjust to preempt cleaning up? I mean, and and you talk about about it in the book, but I'm just thinking that there's so much other areas that will leave a toxic legacy. I think some people be like, oh, the beach will move in 10 miles, big deal. It's just like, well, what's left is the festering toxic soup if, if we don't deal with it now. 
Yeah. So at first, I want to quibble a bit with your question. <laughs> um, Go for it. In in the suggestion that sites are not properly cleaned up, CERCLA is a a risk driven process where there is a lot of study done before big sites are cleaned up and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, or if it's a state level cleanup, the state equivalent agency spends a lot of time and energy looking at human health and environmental risks in determining how cleanups will be done. So it is sometimes the case that CERCLA sites are cleaned up in a way where some hazardous waste is permitted to remain on site. And that doesn't mean that the cleanup's not been properly done. It means that the agency and the parties who are conducting the cleanup have come to an agreement that there's a technique by which you can leave hazardous waste in place and they're not going to pose unacceptable risks to human health or the environment. So, for example, if you have an upland site in an industrial area and you know it has contaminated soil, but it's been paved over and it has a bunch of warehouses on it, you might say, well, gee, you know, what we want you to do is something we call an institutional control. We're going to put a land use restriction on this so that it can only be used for these kinds of uses and the contaminated soil is going to remain covered because in that state, it can't actually get in contact with a person or a bug or anything else. And so it's not going to be causing environmental harm just because it's there. All right. I'm going to quibble right back. You got a situation where let's say everything sort of meets the criteria of being cleaned up. And, I, and I'm generalizing big time. I know there's all sorts of legal speak when it comes to cleaning things up, but then Okay, overlay three feet of ocean on top of that. Are these super fun cleanups factoring that in? Like, again, okay, you've put concrete and you're not exposing things, but with putting water on top of something, do you have to fundamentally ref reform what defines a cleanup? You know, I think you might, and I think there, there are two ways that that might happen. The first is for sites that have already been cleaned up in this manner, if a surplus site, a super fun site, leaves pollutants in place. It becomes subject to a process that's called the five-year review process, which is exactly what it sounds like. So every five years, the regulatory agency, usually the EPA, has to come back in and make a finding that the original cleanup they approved is still sufficiently protective of human health and the environment. And there's all kinds of guidance on how these five-year reviews are done and the kinds of factors that the agency should consider in figuring out whether the cleanup they previously approved is still sufficiently su protective. And of particular relevance to our conversation about sea level rise, one of the things that they are to consider is whether a site that was not projected to be subject to flooding is now flooding, or whether a site was thought to be outside of the 100-year floodplain and is now within it. And I think that that's really where you will see the leading edge of sort of CERCLA practice and CERCLA and sea level rise, right? Because as you, Doug, and your listeners are well aware, the first thing that we will see in most places is more frequent inundation, right? That higher tides will start to flood things right along the coast, not just suddenly everything is going to be underwater. And so if you see sites along the coast that have been cleaned up with some kind of a control where contaminants are left in place and they start to flood on high tide or they flood during big storms, then that is going to require some serious reevaluation about whether those remedies are adequate or whether additional cleanup of the site is required. All right. I want to go back to the concept of this huge transfer of private land to public land. <laughs> when you think about it, like it, libertarians, if they truly appreciate what was about to happen, they would, you know, maybe take a bit more active interest in all this. If you are sort of advising clients on risk, the, especially coastal clients, is that coming up in those sort of when you're advising these clients? It's saying this, this is coming in the pipeline here. I mean, are, are those conversations coming up? In terms of transfer of title, I think we're not there yet. I, I do think that one of the, the things that we are starting to talk a lot about is, and this ties back to your previous question about CERCLA as well, is if you have an active industrial site in the coastal zone and it is likely to be subject to at least, you know, regular inundation, flooding or permanent inundation and going totally underwater, then we're starting to have a lot of really interesting conversations around 
what kinds of cleanup requirements are going to be in place on a prospective basis, right? So not how are you going to deal with sites you've already cleaned up where the agency might decide they need to be reopened, but more, you know, you're running a refinery or a chemical plant or a port, right, that, that is on the water and probably for your particular industrial use must be located along the water. And how are you going to have to decommission that site to account for the enhanced risks that come from regular flooding or ultimate inundation? You know, I have listeners that work for governments and private sector, and I, I want this to be practical information for them. So if let's say you're a local government planner, and you, you talk a bit about this in the book, especially I think in relation to, to corporations, but you know, what are some of the, the laws that entities have to comply with in NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, is an, is an important one. What can people be doing today to start sort of factoring in these sort of coastal threats and sort of the legal liabilities that might start popping up? You, get, you just mentioned that it might be just a bit premature, but is it, I mean, I, I guess across the board, meeting environmental regulations, are there things that they could be doing? What would you recommend to them? Yeah, so um, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, only applies to major federal actions. So that's not going to influence states and local governments so much unless they're doing something that has a federal cost share component or requires a federal permit. There are state equivalents, though. And, you know, California has been particularly active under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. There is quite a lot of litigation about how climate impacts get factored in. I, I don't know that that really answers your core question. I think that for for state and local planners, I think one of the trickiest things in this area is that because we rely on common law doctrines to tell us where property boundaries are and sort of what the rules of play are about who owns what as the sea level rises, those doctrines are essentially their judge-made law, right? So they exist sort of when somebody writes a judicial opinion and they're out there. And so functionally what that means in a lot of states is that some of these doctrines are very well-defined. Some of them may not be so well-defined at all. And so you may be looking to see what's going on in other states, even though that's not the applicable law to you, and be sort of out at the edges of what, what you know for sure or the law in your state is. And I think that's a real challenge for local planners because, for example, if you wanted to do something like say, hey, you know, we're going to go to requiring everybody to have wetlands, right, that you have to have wetlands along the coast and you have to let the wetlands move where they're going to move. That's something that the state may be able to do within its regulatory authority if it can show that it's just making a regulation that codifies its common law. But if your common law is not so well defined, you may be kind of doing that as a shot in the dark and hoping that legally it's going to stick. And so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done in states in better defining their own views of the law so that they're able to empower planners and people who have authority over land use to have a full suite of information about what tools are available to them legally as they try to promote adaptation. Okay, you'd mentioned the courts making some decisions, and it, it's my understanding some some lawyers never even do the work that they do in a courtroom, right? Mm -hmm. Or what about what about you? Is it something that's part of what you do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not not on the climate change side. Now I do it, the, the other hat I wear in our environmental practice. I do a lot of work with expert witnesses, but you know most of this work, at least the kind of work I do, is not really done in a courtroom. You know, there is a, a okay. <laughs> very active litigation practice on the individual property owner disputes level, right? So cases about beach access go to the Supreme Court not infrequently. Some of the uh, biggest property rights cases that have ever been before the Supreme Court are about the right to access the beach. So that it would be false to say that there is not an active litigation practice around it. Just the slice of it that I do does not involve a lot of stand up in court time. Okay, I was just curious. And what I'm getting at is that I think a lot of us, when we hear about some of these big environmental cases that go before the courts, what's a bit frustrating, too, especially if you're involved more with scientists, is that all this information is presented in, in the courts. And you, you reference a lot of uh, legal cases within the book, and it's just 
ultimately the judge might make a big decision or there might be a jury involved. These are people that might not get science very well. And I think it, it's very frustrating that some major decision will rely on people that aren't, I, I, I guess, the best people to take that science information. And maybe you could sort of defend the, the legal, I mean, are judges and are these juries, are, are they, I don't know what my question here really is. It's more of a frustration of, are they up, for answering these big questions that involve climate science? Well, you know, I think there has been um, an active debate in the academy for a long time about whether specialist courts for things like environment, intellectual property, things that are really technical are appropriate. Uh, you know, that is not the way that we have gone. And so I would submit to you that it is our job as attorney advocates to educate the trier of fact, be it a judge or a jury, about the the pieces of the puzzle that they really need to understand to make a decision. Uh, I would also suggest to you, I think one of the really important things that I tried to spell out in the book is that sometimes a judge might be bound by what's out there, even if they get the science, right? They, they might be stuck with the law. So for example, one of the funny distinctions that the law draws is that this advancement of the public trust and the transfer of title is actually sensitive to how the high tide line moves. So the law makes a distinction between gradual shifts in the property boundary. So your beach gradually erodes away over years. You're losing that, right? The public trust is moving inland and essentially your property is getting submerged and it's not yours anymore. However, most states recognize a common law doctrine called avulsion. And what avulsion is, is if there's a hurricane and you suddenly lose 10 feet of your beach in a single event that is generally not recognized to move the property boundary. For anybody who studied coastal geology, separating those two things makes no sense at all, right? The law should theoretically treat them both the same way, but that's not how they're treated at common law because the common law cases that look at these things are really looking at what were people's expectations, right? So if you lose something immediately overnight, the law sort of has a sense of like, well, that's not really fair. That wasn't what you expected was going to happen to you. And so it may be that you're in front of a judge who totally understands sea level rise, understands the risks, understand what's going on. But because of these legal doctrines that they're dealing with, their hands may be a little bit tied. I'm thinking of environmental groups and, and the use of the law. Like I, I've worked for environmental, I've worked in nonprofit, I've worked for federal government, state, and so to me, the the tank, the bazooka in their toolkit is, is using the law, the the lawsuit, and most of the time you're trying to influence policy and you're educating people. But when it comes to adaptation, do you feel like it it should be one of those approaches in in the toolkit for I environmental groups that now we have enough? There's the science is is there. It's just sort of saying, all right, I want to prevent some maladaptation. Let's sue. You know, I I think that that litigation is inevitably part of the conversation. Um, I mean, as you know, I have been involved with the Surfrider Foundation, and I know you've spoken to our CEO, Chad. And while litigation is certainly not a first choice strategy there, it is always a part a part of the conversation in terms of preserving public access. And I think that those kinds of issues will will likely continue to go to court and will be an area where we will see what, what one might term adaptation litigation. You know, I think that one of the really interesting questions when you start to invoke these doctrines of public trust is sort of who's going to stand up for the public trust, right? Are you going to start to see states come in and say, oh, no, you know what? I, I am the trustee of the public trust. And so I speak for the coastal resources and the fisheries resources and all those things. And you can't do whatever it is you want to do because it's a violation of the public trust or are you going to see an uptick in litigation where citizens are coming forward and saying, hey, I'm a beneficiary of the public trust and you state are not upholding your duty as a trustee to protect these resources for me. And so I'm going to take you to court and make you do something. <laughs> was that was that a sort of a recommendation or? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's something that I think we will. We will certainly see happen. I think that thinking about it in terms of bigger, broader, large scale suits, it's a tricky thing, right? Because again, it's a, it's a property by property kind of thing. And so I, I don't really know where it will go. <laughs> oh, okay. 
I'll lift you off the hook for that one for the time <laughs> being. All right, I, I'm going to pivot a, a bit here. You know what? And just as an aside, someone told me no one's using the word pivot anymore. Have you heard this? No. Is this something you've heard? <laughs> I know, this is ridiculous. Pivot. Can't use the word pivot anymore. Can't dance the macarena. Can't use the word pivot. All right. So you've listened to the podcast multiple times and you've probably heard me talk about adaptation kind of versus resilience, right? Mm -hmm. You've heard me chat, chat about this. And so I haven't hid my opinion on the many definitions of resilience out there. And as, as an aside, in one of my recent resilience references, it was described to to me as a rant. And so, um, yes, Christy, I did notice the use of that term in your email to me. She'll know what I'm talking about, Margaret. Um, but I digress. Is there a legal definition for resilience? You know, that's a really interesting question. And I'm going to have to say I don't think so. <laughs> Um, and I, and Wait, you didn't learn that in law school? Darn it. No, I didn't. But but I will say, you know, I, I have listened to you talk about adaptation versus resilience before. And it's something that's very resonant for me, because I do think that one of the interesting questions that we deal with when you start to look at the intersection of law and policy and adaptation options is sort of what what are you trying to adapt? Right. I think it's something I grapple with in the book. I think there's it's important to understand that there are Things you can do that promote particular kinds of resilience in the short to medium term that aren't necessarily consistent with what your long term adaptation goals might be. And so let me give you a really concrete example. Uh, insurance, right? So you can carry insurance, um, oftentimes subsidized federal flood insurance, but that's a whole nother conversation. But you can have insurance products that will do things like Make sure that after a hurricane with a really big storm surge that you can put a community back together looking much like it was before, you know, and maybe there's some hazard mitigation grant money. So houses are now up on stilts or something like that, but you're fundamentally rebuilding in a hazard exposed area. And if the thing that you care about being resilient is sort of your, your connectedness to place or a particular town and the social fabric that comes from having that community there, you may have done a really good job in making them resilient by providing insurance and providing financial resources for them to go back where they were. That's not necessarily adaptation, right? Because you, you are still there. You're still exposed to the hazard. Eventually, you're going to have to reckon with attempting to hold back the sea or going somewhere else. Well, that was that was great. Um, I, again, I think it comes down to that. There's there's such nuances to what people are doing with it, and I guess that's sort of my point too. But uh, you wouldn't describe what I talk about as a rant, though, right? No, I just think you have some strongly held views. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just giving this this woman Christy a hard time, and when she listens to it, I'll, I'll take great pleasure out of that in in your part of this. But uh, I've got some questions, just more, you know, just broader questions and just your own sort of personal opinions on these things. And so I like to visualize these things as stories and how things really kind of play out. And I think of the the lawyers in general and as the coasts degrade and like as society really sort of kicks in as people are leaving the coast, because it will happen. I, I'm visualizing there will be billboards for clash action lawsuits against sea level rise in whatever form. I mean. Do you sense that this will happen? I mean, lawyers are there to sort of – I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. But you know what I'm saying, that there's the, if there's sort of a, an opportunity to kind of take advantage of maybe some federal funding, whatever. But I mean, are we headed in that direction where lawyers really are almost on the leading edge of action being taken, but a billboard for a class action lawsuit? You know, I don't know. I and mean, part of the reason I did this book right, is that I, I want people to understand that – if we do nothing, right, if we just let sea levels rise, people's property rights are gone. And so if you just lose your property by operation of the common law, it's hard to envision what what kind of a lawsuit are you going to have? Are you going to sue the ocean for rising? Um, I, I, right, I, I mean, right. I'm saying that very facetiously, but right. That, that's that I think is a, is a trickier question, you know, and there's all kinds of really interesting and legally com complicated issues around climate causality. And not that I'm saying we don't know what causes climate change, but in terms of legal causality, I think that's a very tricky issue. I think that they're the more interesting thing, if you're trying to look out, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, where is legal practice going to be with respect to sea level rise? 
you, you could foresee that you're going to have communities of people who are, are disproportionately impacted and are disproportionately impacted either because of land use decisions that have been made by local governments or because Certain kinds of sites have caused certain kinds of impacts to them. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that, something that I worry a lot about, right? We talk a lot about inundation of the immediate coast. So, so it's easy to think about, you know, an industrial site floods and then the contaminants wash back out to sea. And we're worried about people who are swimming in the sea and the fish and the coral and all of those things, which are all things we should absolutely be worried about. But we, we don't think about is, well, what happens when those floodwaters start to come high enough that instead of washing that all back out to sea, we're pushing it back into the community that lives adjacent, right? So the flooding is going up high enough. It's going through your facility and out the other side. And I do think those, those are the kinds of cases that start to look a lot more like more traditional environmental law cases that we're familiar with, right? The, your power plant emits soot from its stack and it lands on my yard and I don't like it or I'm worried it's making me sick, right? That that feels a lot more like the normal rubric of environmental litigation. And so that's somewhere where I do think that we will see litigation in the future. And it may well be a driver of adaptation behavior because as corporations have to figure out how to manage those liabilities, either because they're actually facing them or because they're worried about the prospect of risk, that will change their calculus in how they think about sea level rise. Right. Well, my next question <laughs> related to that was that this is a derogatory term toward lawyers, but, you know, the ambulance chaser, is there a flood chaser? Is there a sea level rise chaser? Are we going to get to the point in society? And I think that's actually useful. It's like when the the broader society sort of recognizes this is part of what we're living with. And so as we're encouraging people to leave the coast, if there's financial incentives like lawyers will inevitably play a role, it would be nice if we could do it in some way that captured the public's imagination, I guess, with a sense of urgency. So, yes. <laughs> like, I was hoping that we would come up with some equivalent to ambulance chaser, but I don't think you're going to go along with me for that one. It's something related to sea level rise, but I don't think it's easy. I've got a few more questions here, and I'm looking at a couple of them, and they're just whoppers, and I'm just thinking that you, you don't want to answer these, but I, I should just throw it out <laughs> anyway. Well, first of all, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do it. You know what? Th these are the ones that are, and you don't have to go into detail. Just be more of like, Doug, that's stupid. Um, but this isn't a hypothetical, and I had all these hypothetical questions. And Is it legally possible for the federal government to seize all coastal land based on future sea level rise projections? And so let's say they say, you know, there's no fly zones where the feds have say over what who can go in this airspace. Let's say five miles inland from the coast. Not that they would, not that you're recommending it, but could the feds literally do that or would they just get so tripped up into the takings issue? I mean, they'd have they'd have to pay unambiguously. They would have to pay for it. Right. So so could they theoretically perhaps can they afford to do it? I don't think so. I think the more interesting question there uh, and this is not in the book, but I, I wrote an incredibly wonky law review article on this is. If you knew that land was going to go underwater, could some level of government entity restrict what you can do with your private property now because they know it's going to become part of a public resource later? Hmm. Interesting. Well, I think and not that that would be the approach, but I, I just think we're headed. We, we I don't think we truly appreciate the implications of three, four five feet of sea level rise. And you, I, I think you do. But it's just going to just radically challenge us on how we deal with issues and I don't think we've got our heads around it. And to those kind of crazy thoughts now will just be like, Oh, well let's do that because it'll be that sort of, I guess, consequential when, when you have that, those kind of changes to the land. So a couple more, here's another crazy one. <laughs> Here was me. This is a policy question, but I was thinking of how we encourage people to get off the coast within a legal framework. And you know, you're familiar with like cap and trade programs and the whole notion of, uh, you start with a given number and over time you're trying to get people like, let's say pollutants down and such and a cap and trade for land. Let's say a local government manages 10,000 acres along the coast. People want to live there right now, but over time you're trying to encourage people. So on an annual basis, every two years that you only allow, let's say 9,900 acres to be inhabited. And over time you're encouraging people and yet the whole point of this question was like the whole – like redefining what a property right is and are we going to have to start thinking like that? And that probably is a really stupid idea, but it's just to me it's private property. People, it, it's such 
it's so important to some folks, whereas others, it's it's not so important. And I just think we have to redefine it. So there are legal constructs that can do things like that. We call them transferable development rights. Yeah. Okay. Right. So and, and under TDRs. yeah, and under a TDR, right, you might you might do something like say, gee, you know, the total density of development we're going to allow along here is. X, but we're not going to say, you know, your house can't be more than a certain amount of square feet. We're going to say total for this area, it's got to be under this cap. And so then you could trade some of your ability to develop to someone else. So, you know, there, those kinds of legal frameworks do exist. It's not a, a crazy idea. I think the, the more challenging sort of nugget in what you're talking about is could you take rights away from people who are already there? And I think that's really challenging both legally and as a policy matter, right? Legally, of course, if you're taking a right that I would emphasize that someone actually has, right? So not an imagined right to protect a house with a seawall, but some property right they actually have, like to live on the property that is actually there. And you're just saying, "Mm, you know what? Not that many people are allowed to live here. It's your turn to move. That's a taking. You've got to pay them. Well, I guess in that situation, I was thinking, all right, so like, let's say, uh, and let's just use round numbers. There's a hundred houses and then like in a given year, five houses are for sale and you're trying to get that total number of houses that are inhabited down. And so if five are sold, like maybe three to other people, but two of those that the county buys and then they just, they give a fair price, but then they just don't resell that. And then I guess that's that way of that you're maintaining some, the, the broader property rights, the bundle of sticks, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, yeah, in TDRs, I, I, yeah, I used to deal with those things. <laughs> when I was in Georgia, I would deal with a lot of land usage. Right. TDRs, you know, there are a lot of existing tools that would be very useful as we do this. It, what, it, what's missing is just a sort of like political leadership, but that's a different story. This is another one of those questions. Are, are you familiar with the Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District case? No. <laughs> Okay. It has nothing to do with climate change except for its science. And so it, it's probably been maybe 12, 13 years, but are you familiar with the whole intelligent design movement? Yes. And so the Kitzmiller case was where they were trying to teach intelligent design in public schools, and there was a challenge. And ultimately, the judge ruled that there is nothing to intelligent design. It's junk and whatever. And it basically blew apart intelligent design as a movement. It was really one of those cases you're like, wow, you really don't hear about it much. And I guess, Mike, what what I wanted to kind of bring you in is that are there court cases, are there opportunities where we we really could just have sort of a a policy-defining court case that would help us get a bit farther on climate change? Like, Because I felt like that case was so important. It's one of those that it's almost a Hollywood type case where it just set the stage. And like, can we do that with climate change? So I think the most important thing that's going on right now in this regard is uh, there's a case going on out in Oregon called the Juliana case. And Juliana is one in this line of cases that have been brought by children plaintiffs seeking to assert a a different kind of public trust. So they're not talking about public trust like you and I have been talking about for the last hour related to, you know, coastal property boundaries and inundated land. They are trying to get courts to adopt a more expansive view of public trust that protects a right in the atmosphere and using that as a tool to say that there is a duty by the government to essentially protect them from climate change. Uh, and there had been a series of these cases that had not been successful for a variety of reasons, but the case in Oregon has been moving forward. Uh, and most recently, the Ninth Circuit issued an order on the government's motion for mandamus, which was essentially a procedural move to try to get the appellate court to tell the district court the case can't go forward that functionally permitted that case to go forward. And so that group of children's plaintiffs will now be able to proceed into at least the discovery phase of their litigation against the federal government, in which what they're ultimately seeking is some kind of an order or a remedy requiring broad federal policy on climate change. Yeah, I'm not convinced like some, you know, defining court case will help us go to that next level. But it would be great if it did, if it just sort of like cleared the way of the skepticism, even if people are continuing to be skeptical, it's just like that. It's just it's now the legal lay of the land and everything, you know, will kind of go forward after that. We'll see. I wanted to ask you a, a bit about being a, a lawyer that does adaptation really quickly. Would you recommend 
this field of adaptation is growing and it's you know almost in every sector would would you recommend someone who wants to get into adaptation to become a lawyer I think if somebody cares a lot about adaptation and they want to be a lawyer, then it's a great place to be in. I think it is important that I say that while adaptation is an emerging area of practice, anybody who does this work is doing a lot of environmental or other kinds of work as well. So, you know, I think either if what someone wants to do is spend 100% of their time solving adaptation problems, there are probably areas where one could be I don't know if more impactful is the right word, but, you know, land use planning. There's a lot of other areas related to actual policy decisions that are being made on the ground that are probably closer to full time adaptation. But I mean, adaptation is going to pose a lot of really fascinating legal questions. And I think it's going to be a really interesting area of legal practice. Okay, so how do you stay up to date on adaptation? I know you do your court cases and stuff, but are there what, what kind of circles do you try to run in? How do you how do you kind of keep your your mind sharp on the topic? I I read as much as I possibly can. I I listen to a bunch of different news sources. I am very fortunate that I have managed to remain close with some folks who have stayed in academia, so I lean pretty heavily upon them to keep me up to date. And I try to guest lecture from time to time because that forces me to go back and sort of revisit what was old and see if it's new again. <laughs> What's your favorite movie about lawyers? Hmm. <laughs> Come on. My favorite movie about lawyers. It's probably Legally Blonde. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. And the most important question of our conversation, do you have a favorite lawyer joke? I do not. Oh, Come on. The lawyers are supposed to have the best ones. No. All right. I, I'm not going to put you Sorry. on the spot. I thought when lawyers are all hanging out together, smoking cigars, you got your best lawyer jokes. Oh, I have I to say it's been ages since anyone's even told me a lawyer joke. I haven't heard one recently, but I'm not a lawyer. Okay. All right. Last question. And you know what this one is. If you had to recommend one guest to come on the podcast and help make it happen, who would it be? I'm going to give you two. <laughs> all right. Bring it uh, on. So the first is Meg Caldwell. Um, I mentioned Meg earlier. She was one of my research advisors, but she's now the deputy director of oceans at the Packard Foundation. And they're doing a lot of really interesting work around uh, funding capacity building for adaptation. And the other thing they're doing that I think is of real interest is they're doing a lot of work on ocean acidification and climate, because I think that's one of the other really important adaptation issues that doesn't get a lot of attention is what's going on with our oceans and acidification and how that's going to impact marine ecosystems and what that's going to mean for us more broadly as a society. And the second is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to, and you, and you could make an introduction to Meg? I certainly could. <laughs> awesome. All right. Number two. The second is Austin Becker, who is a professor at the University of Rhode Island. Um, Austin was at Stanford at the same time as I was and wrote his dissertation on ports and climate change adaptation. And he now runs a really interesting research program looking at ports and what he calls climate criti critical resources. So essentially big infrastructure along the coast and how you think about adapting it. Awesome. Two very great suggestions. This was a great conversation to me. It did get a little wonky, but I think you were probably less wonky or less <laughs> idiotic than I was. And so I, I hope this is just a conversation that people get a lot out of. And, and in fact, I think the, the sky's the limit when it comes to law, and I hope that you'd be willing to come back on again because I just think about the book, and you know we just scratched the surface of what's in there, and, and I'm sure we can have a, a thousand different kind of conversations. And so I, I do – you know, maybe there's an idea that you have, but I, I do want to continue this conversation because I think it's an important one. But I want to thank you for coming on and any sort of final thoughts. Well, thank you. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> hey, adapters. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Margaret. I was geeking out on the policy implications of sea level rise and the law. Hopefully you were too. Okay, as promised, here's my interview with Jesse Terry and Alex Wong, two musicians who have produced an album focusing on a small indigenous community in Alaska. I'm hosting two musicians. With me are Jesse Terry and Alex Wong, who have collaborated on a six-song EP called Kivalina. It's about a small town in Alaska that could be uninhabitable by 2025 due to the effects of climate change. Hey, Jesse and Alex, welcome to the podcast. Hey, how you doing? 
Hey, thanks for having us. Okay, first off, tell me a bit about your history. Uh, well, I grew up in a music fa- uh, musical family. I was painting first and then went to Berkeley College of Music, like fell in love with music and songwriting, and I graduated from there, actually. It was rare, and uh, it's cooler to quit, actually. And then I moved straight to Nashville. I was there for eight or nine years. And then I just, um, I've been back home in the Northeast ever since moving from Nashville and touring. All right, Alex, what about you? Yeah, I actually grew up in the Bay Area, California, and I made my way to Nashville in a very roundabout way. I was in L.A. for a little bit, New York for about 10 years, and then eventually Nashville. I've been here about five years now. Why write an album about climate change? Neither of you are experts in the area, right? Yes, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, I think for us, it was it was being so moved by this story of Kivalina. And, you know, as songwriters, I, I think you, you hone in on emotions and things you can connect to. And for me, like hearing the story of Kivalina, just 400 villagers being completely impacted by this and their whole lives changed forever. That, to me, was a, a very, very compelling story, a uh, very heartbreaking story, but lots of emotions there, lots to write about. It, it kind of caught us by surprise, I would say. I think Jesse and I had planned to write, but we hadn't sort of settled on what we were going to write. And we actually were not planning on making a full album. I think we were just trying to get together to, to write a song. And at the time, I had just been reading some, uh, I had just discovered an article, maybe through a link or something about Kivalina. And I kind of went down a rabbit hole right around the time Jesse was getting into town. So he kind of, <laughs> he, I sort of unloaded on him about what I was learning about and what I was feeling. And, and it just affected our, our, our day and, and, You know, one song turned into several songs and it just was sort of, you know, I think you, as Jesse was saying, you know, as songwriters, I think you can't escape what's happening in in your life, in your head, even if you're writing through another voice. So it was just sort of what was occupying our hearts and our minds at the time. Okay, so you you did your own reading uh, about the issue there. So but you have these six songs. Uh, Could you sort of briefly describe what are the, the songs covering are they just i mean they're talking about the communities talking about the sort of the challenges what what are you really when you're sitting there writing about this what what kind of came up we read and and watched all kinds of footage and read all kinds of interviews with these villagers and as alex said we just wrote the first song i don't think even after the first song we we thought about writing a whole ep but as we delved deeper there were just these really amazing heartbreaking stories so we decided to write these songs and they they kind of became, I think for me, it was like almost accidental. They became like this arc of a, a fictional cu- a couple, you know, and the EP starts out kind of as they find out that their homeland is going underwater, you know, so soon and by the year 2025. And then the ending, the last song is talks about kind of what they will do in that scenario, you know, where, where will, where they'll go if they'll try to find another village and, and stick to the ancient traditions or if they'll try to adapt and move to, you know, a quote unquote more modern place like an anchorage. That was the concept for us. My question is, uh, have you reached out to anyone in that community and, and shared the music? And if you have, what, what, what has the response been? Yeah. And, and I would just add it in terms of the, the writing, you know, again, we kind of found ourselves in this position of being uh, affected almost through analogy, through thinking of our own lives and our own families. And I think this, the place we were trying to write from, it did end up sort of being a narrative, but it was a fictional narrative. And we were really um, trying to not sort of put words in the mouths of, of actual villagers that, because we don't have uh, that experience but it was more about trying to find the commonality between what one might feel and how that might relate to someone, someone like us and sort of talk in terms of, you know, this fictional couple that we ended up writing. It's sort of a breakup album. It's <laughs> that is couched with the backdrop of this 
crazy looming climate event. But those are things that I, you know, I think we, we connected through, wow, what would, what would my family do? What would, you know, if the Bay Area, which is, you know, not a unheard of possibility, but if something, if we had to, the geography had to be adapted there, what, how would that, how would those sort of more mundane questions affect our and our family's lives? And so that's sort of what sparked a lot of the writing for the songs. It wasn't about trying to, tell an informative narrative we just had a couple big weeks related to climate change there was the climate strike there was this climate week in new york did you guys do anything sort of in alignment with with that were you performing or sharing what you were doing here i I was actually driving i think i don't know probably eight hours that day on the climate strike like on tour and for me like the best thing that i've been able to do like with with the music, even before it was released, was just playing these songs and just telling this story about this this one village that's obviously not the only place that's being affected by climate or the only place that is going to have climate change refugees. But my mom was marching in the climate. Nice. Yeah, my mom was do was fighting the good fight, and I was I was talking to her and rooting her on that day, and I was I was on the way to a show. So that's I. I feel like music is the best way for for me personally to to have any kind of impact or tell that story and just just tell a true story. You know, it's not it's not a political thing. It's to me, it's a moral thing. And I've had a daughter since we wrote these songs. It changes the way you view the world and obviously changes the way that, that, you know, I want to make sure that she has a world to live in. And I live right here on the coast in New England. So. It's it's something that could hit home for all of us. Okay, so let me just see if I have this straight. On the climate strike day, your mom was participating, and you were driving eight hours, burning all those fossil fuels. Is that what I, you, you were? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that and that no no no. It's giving you a hard time. Giving you no 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 because I do I do show up to shows and I think about what I do for a living and the amount of miles I drive per year and obviously you don't want to be hip, hypocritical about that like. You know, I'm I'm hoping for for wholesale changes that we really hopeful that there's there's huge changes. I don't want to be burning those <laughs> fossil fuels. You know, we we all do. I'm giving you a hard time. <laughs> no, uh, no, I know, I know. It's just it's something. It's it, it is it does feel. It's like it's a conflict though. You know, I mean, it's a as you get out of your car, you're filling up the gas tank. It's a it is a conflict like for me. I, I just want your mom oh, yeah. to have something over you for next Thanksgiving. So. <laughs> she does. She definitely does. <laughs> I, I would say, Doug, that uh, one of the one of the main sort of drivers of writing this album, uh, at least for me personally, and, and maybe maybe for Jesse, was was that as a non-expert and as someone who's not working their profession in that space, it's very easy to feel helpless sometimes and to kind of there's so many sort of scattershot disorganized ways that we're all sort of fed to help this massive, massive issue, but they're all buying a reusable straw, but then flying to a business meeting. It's hard for the average sort of person in, I guess my, my position as a just civilian to be focused with energy towards like helping. And I think, for us, it was just a way to promote a conversation from a place where we could learn as well. No, I think this is fantastic. And the notion that you you, you haven't even been there, but you've read about it and you felt inspired and the, the issue of climate change, you want to do something. I mean, writing some songs, producing it, this is a big, big task. And so I, I'm very encouraged by that. And as you guys get into the climate space, if you talk to the scientists and you're dealing with like policy people, they are terrible storytellers. And so we need more people like in the broader public kind of getting in the space and helping kind of create better awareness. And so, yeah, what you guys music, yes, the yes. best kind of stories kind of are, are sung. Right. So that, that's fabulous it's, that you guys were inspired. It's it's funny that you said that because I would never say that, you know, as, a, as an assumption, but I actually Alex and I actually went out to Berkeley and met scientists and performed for them. And that's the feedback I got from them. Like even on just the drive from the airport was just like, we like being in the lab. We like being experts on this. Like we need more people like you that aren't experts 
but that are passionate and that believe in us to go out and get that message out there. Okay, we're going to have uh, – it's a treat for you, my listeners is that we're going to listen to just a bit of their first song on the album, Landfall. Okay, guys, let's have a listen to this. By the time it makes landfall It will shake the stars from the northern sky We'll be gone comes a few glowing lines in black and white so what's up next are you guys touring just around this album are you guys i know you're not together right now but any sort of uh climate tours in the near future so people can hear what you're doing the next thing we have is that we're actually playing a conference in dc called the national conference on citizenship but it's basically a uh, two-day conference for young activists and they are having some artists and performers come to uh, play and to talk to the attendees. So that's sort of our next scheduled thing. That's the space that we're really excited about with this project. I mean, Jesse and I both have careers as solo performers and writers, but on this collaboration, we have always hoped that we could get kind of speak directly more to people in the activist space and in the climate activist space and just be a little more direct about sharing these stories to people who care. <laughs> yes. It has never been about like, I, I think this, this record is not necessarily uh, um, as much of a check me out type record. I think we're really, you know, it's more about the stories and the message rather than maybe bolstering our status uh, we have plenty of projects that do that. We we have we spend all day talking about ourselves outside of this. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's our goal with the project. Awesome. And uh, Jesse, can you, you tell my listeners how they can listen to this? And I have show notes and I can include some links, but I'm assuming it's it's on a various pap- platforms. Yes. Yeah. It's great to to listen on Spotify um, and follow us. I, I believe it's it's on both my, you know, my Spotify page on under jesse terry and it's on it's on yours as well alex right we we're able to get it on both both pages and it's great to follow us and that's the best way to kind of keep in touch and of of course it's available other places too apple music and amazon and all, all the itunes all the normal all the normal spots but yeah we definitely want people to hear the music and and dig dig deeper into the stories Right. So I, I listened to all six songs and I'll be perfectly honest with you guys. I'm, I've had the musical taste of a 16 year old. I still just listen to like Van Halen and Motley Crue and it's embarrassing. <laughs> and, but Nothing wrong with that. That you guys have done a great job here. And it, you know, I, I was trying to think it had sort of a Simon and Garfunkel vibe, just highly produced. It sounds really good. And, um, you can, congratulations. And I think that's just great. I think hopefully there's other artists out there who are being inspired by the climate crisis. Just said to like, speak out, and I appreciate you. you guys have done what you've done, but uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank you for having us. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. So stick around until the end of the episode to hear a full version of one of their songs. Thanks again, guys, for reaching out and creating this album. It's important to create new ways to communicate these issues, and quite frankly, more people probably like listening to this song than watching a webinar. All right, some travel. I'm going to Gainesville, Florida to lead a podcast workshop at a science communication event at the University of Florida. If you're interested in learning more about how podcasting can be a tool in the communication you do, please reach out. I do these trainings. Also, if you and your organization are interested in partnering on a specific podcast, let me know. There are so many stories to tell on this emerging issue. Let's see if we can collaborate on a future episode. Also, if you are interested in having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. Folks, I speak a lot and you're going to enjoy this. Think of how many boring presentations you've sat in front of. That won't be me. I've been doing some keynote presentations and they are so much fun. I share stories from the podcast and my own experiences in adaptation. I will talk about adaptation in ways that will motivate you and inspire you. And you'll actually learn a thing or two. So you can contact me at the website, americadapts.org. All right. 
Your donation makes a huge difference. You are providing financial support to further communicating what will be the defining issue of this and future generations. And what I mean is adapting to climate change. You can donate a very simple website. The link is in my show notes. You hear me talk about how you can support the podcast and what we're doing here with American Apps. Of course, financial support is always welcome. But please also consider sharing one of your favorite episodes on your own social media. Plug it with your friends, family, and colleagues. Word of mouth is the single greatest way podcasts grow. Within my show notes, you'll find all sorts of ways you can share. Don't forget to join the Facebook page in the Facebook community group. The group is private, but just search for America Daps and ask to join, and I will approve you right away. On that note, I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. If you have an idea for a guest, let me know. Seriously, it is the highlight of my week hearing from you, and sometimes it leads to really cool things. I'm at americadaps at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time. And don't forget to stick around for this climate change song. Nobody knows where we're from. A sliver beneath frozen sun. Doesn't matter to anyone Oh, I cry a little Cause this was home This was mine And who's to say what a civilized We fought no wars We burned no skies Yet we're caught in I feel like we're headed for nowhere